Hello, I'm Yanis Simonides. Today we conclude our first series from a cycle of programs called Holy Cross Live, which have been designed to introduce you to the basic teachings of Christian orthodoxy. In the course of this series, we have spoken with clergy and lay theologians who currently teach at a Hellenic College and Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. In today's program, The Orthodox Way of Life, we will try to answer the question, what is expected of an Orthodox Christian in his or her everyday life? Today's guests are His Grace, Bishop Methodius of Boston, President of Hellenic College, Holy Cross School of Theology, the Reverend Dr. Stanley Harakas, Professor of Orthodox Theology, and Dr. Luis Pachavos, Professor of Canon Law and the Director of Field Education at Holy Cross. Welcome to our program. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Now, reading Paul's various epistles to the Romans, the Ephesians, the Philippians, and others, we see a recurring theme, that of the requirements placed upon every Christian life after Christ's salvatory action in this world. And Paul is essentially saying, because this is what God in Christ has done for you, this is the way you must lead your own life. Your Grace, may I start with you and, and ask you, what is expected from the hierarchs of our church and of our clergy in terms of their orthodox lifestyle? Well, I think all hierarchs are responsible to God to spiritually lead the flocks entrusted to their care, to be the chief pastors of their diocese, to be the spiritual fathers first and foremost of their priests who are serving the communities, and also guiding the laity uh, day by day in the image and likeness of God. We're called to be leaders in the faith. Right, and uh, absolutely, and that is in terms of their, their responsibilities, uh, uh, shall we call them uh, leadership responsibilities or administrative, what about their own personal life or is there no differentiation? Well, I, I think f first and foremost, in order to be a leader, you have to show a good example. You have to keep your own uh, spiritual life uh, at a very high level to grow yourself spiritually, have a very strong prayer life, um, and a and to lead yourself first and foremost to, to God and then lead others. St. Uh, St. Gregory the theologian has a very beautiful quote about the fact that uh, your first and foremost uh, responsibility is to uh, save your own soul and to uh, be a, live a, 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 an exemplary life so that the other uh, parishioners and uh, uh, learn by example. Learn by example. Right. Now what of the, the clergy? Well, the clergyman is the spiritual father of the community. And he too is supposed to um, be an example in, in, in faith, example in his prayer life, example in, in whatever he does, uh, so that the parishioners will learn from that example. Father Harkas, Dr. Patsavos, any thoughts on this? Or I can, I can, what I can ask you, Dr. Kar uh, Harkas, in terms of what His Grace said, what obstacles, if any, does the clergy have in their exercise and in, in living the life of a true Orthodox Christian? I believe that the clergy probably share the same obstacles that everyone in the church shares. Uh, I am sure that we have some special ones that are unique to us ourselves as priests. And, but I, I think that our task, all of us as Christians, is to um, try to realize what His Grace said, uh, growing in the image and the likeness of God. Christ has uh, performed His saving work and then it is up to each of us to appropriate that and to live it out in ways that we can reflect what God's purpose was for us. So this is over a total range of activities and attitudes, inner dispositions and behavior patterns and what have you. So all of us need to try to realize that. For the clergy in particular, it seems to me that um, because precisely we are clergy, we are called upon to be leaders of a parish, not so much to lord it over parish, but to provide the, the context so that the spiritual growth can take place for all. 
uh, if you speak more particularly of the clergyman's uh, temptations and problems, precisely because he stands at the head of a congregation, he may have greater tendencies towards, say, egotism or pride or, or sh showing himself rather than being what he should be. Or abuse of power, conceivably. That can happen as well. Or the opposite not assuming the, the, the proper uh, power and authority that, one, that a priest has to have as he, as he uh, uh, performs his duties and fulfills his responsibilities. In, in the liturgical life, for instance, a, um, a priest is called upon to be a leader of prayer. But, uh, we know from even the services of the church where occasionally there are hymns that will say that here I am, I'm singing and my mind is someplace else. You know, well, that can happen to us as well and does happen to us. And so there's a constant need for repentance on our part, a reforming and returning ourselves to the calling to which we have been called as, yeah. as clergy. Uh, uh, about two or three years ago, I asked a, uh, 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 a priest who was, um, had a, quite a, a high administrative position. Uh, and uh, I asked the same question, uh, the responsibilities of, of the, the priest uh, to lead an, an exemplary life. And it, was that uh, uh, easy? Was that doable? And was that absolutely necessary, holding oneself to that, that high standard? And, and he said that in his perception, and you may be wrong, and I want to ask you that, and, and perhaps Dr. Patsavos, you can tell us, he said the priest is a vessel. Not necessarily, uh, uh, he, he is not perhaps the representation or, or, or the, the representation of, 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 of God on, on earth, uh, as a lot of people uh, are seeing uh, the priest, but simply a vessel, and as such, is as mortal as anybody else. It's just, it's a role, not necessarily the person. The role has to be kept uh, intact, but not necessarily the person, which perplexed well, me, perplexed me a, a little bit. There is a canonical dimension to that that I think maybe uh, Dr. Patsavos could address, uh, but I would like to come back to okay, that. Okay, I'd like to. <laughs> and we're, you know, we're, I think St. Paul asks, uh, describes our ministry as being ambassadors of Christ. Yes. Okay. And we have to, I believe, hold ourselves to a, a, a high accountability, to a high standard, and work uh, with the grace of God to always try to maintain a very I mean, high, I asked high how, standard. How you, you're being perceived, I said, you know, in a particular way. Yeah. And he said, you know, that's a too great a burden and it's not well, necessary. And I, I was going to say that, first of all, that I find it uh, especially helpful that um, uh, the three of us who are here uh, represent the hierarchy and then the uh, presbyterate and, and the, la the laity. Uh, and it's, although sometimes perceived uh, as if there are distinctions, and there are certainly uh, qualitative distinctions in what uh, a layperson or a, a member of the laity can do uh, in the church, and certainly the privileges that are um, uh, those of the clergy, nonetheless, the same expectations uh, exist for members of the laity as well as for the, uh, the well, clergy. I was going to get to that, absolutely. Yeah. That was my next question to you. But well, I wanted to, to yeah, finalize uh, this I, particular one. The reason one. I addressed uh, Professor Patsavos about this was um, the idea of unworthy clergy and the sacraments that they perform. There is a way that the church distinguishes between a unworthy clergyman and the validity or the, you know, the, uh, of, of the sacraments which he conducts. But that, I think, is not the whole picture. That's the kind of thing that I was going to point to. I think that the clergy um, uh, provide us with, um, how should I say, an example. And uh, uh, the, the clergy do teach. They are the, the teachers of the faith. Um, and they set the example. But this does not mean that uh, um, for this reason, more is expected of them as I said uh, earlier then, uh, of the laity. So uh, we are all called to uh, live the faith. We as Orthodox take great pride in the term orthodoxy, that we uh, are privileged to, to profess the faith which we believe is mm -hmm. the true faith, but it doesn't stop there. This faith then has to be lived, and it has to be lived um, in the same way by the clergy and the laity. All right. I want uh, to return to the clergy, uh, but I'd like to ask you now, can you tell us, 
a little, uh, as we asked about the clergy and the hierarchs, what are the responsibilities of a layperson and the expectations? Well, first and foremost, I think that uh, the, the laity has to um, uh, learn the faith. In other words, has to make a conscious effort uh, to absorb the faith in order to uh, be able to live it. And um, certainly one way that that uh, takes place is by uh, hearing the Word of God as it's uh, preached to us uh, in the church services, and also by um, reading whatever available uh, literature exists on the faith. But there has to be this conscious effort, because without an understanding of the faith, without being instructed in the faith, uh, it's very difficult to live out the faith. When that has uh, occurred, then there are um, there are various practices uh, that uh, the Orthodox Church makes available for a person to strengthen one's uh, uh, spiritual life. Certainly, prayer life uh, is, is stressed very much, but even the, the practice of fasting or abstaining from certain foods, which is uh, still, I would say, st stressed stress a great deal in the Orthodox uh, Church because we feel that this is a very important disciplinary mm -hmm. uh, and ascetic practice mm -hmm. that... Uh, it's a cleansing one that is a very good... Practice. Absolutely. Um, now, what about the obstacles? As we said, and are there more obstacles in, in a... I mean, you know, we, we, there's, there's a lot of temptations yeah. out there in this world. Are there more for the, for the lay people? Uh, I don't believe that there are. In fact, uh, there are probably more obstacles for the clergy since uh, they are expected to set the example and uh, they are perhaps uh, more vulnerable than the laity. But uh, the obstacles are those that, um, uh, how would I say, exist uh, from the society of which we are a part, where you have a society conveying messages <coughs> that, that conflict uh, with, with a great deal of what the church teaches about what is right and what is proper. Um. <laughs> yes. But those also are, are uh, obviously uh, the external promptings to, that conflict with church, uh, the, the requirements of living a Christian life. But they are always fed by the inner, uh, inner person and the uh, movements of our souls and our spirits that can uh, so often justify uh, and uh, prompt us into, into acting in ways that are not uh, godlike and not uh, uh, in conformity with what yes. uh, Christ would have us do. Uh, Your Grace, you um, have uh, been involved in a very interesting program in, in, uh, in recent years, uh, marital counseling uh, uh, in the diocese. Uh, so you have been exposed, I'm sure, as, as everybody else, but I will ask you, uh, many, many years in ministering to both men and women in their various responsibilities. Are there, is there any difference in the role of uh, responsibilities of men versus women in terms of their orthodox lifestyle? Are there more burden or any difference at all? I don't think there's a, uh, I don't think there's a, a difference per se. They're both, both men and women are called, as I mentioned before, uh, through prayer and through the sacramental life to, to grow day by day uh, uh, in, in God's mm -hmm. image and likeness. Uh, they're both called for sal to salvation. Uh, oh, everyone, everyone, of course, has his... Um, men have other uh, roles in, in, in life and, and women uh, their own roles, I think, equal, equally important in the eyes of God. All right. Uh, now, you have also in your role as a bishop and president of the school, you have been um, exposed to uh, uh, many different individuals in different positions in life, those of power and success, uh, middle life, very poor. Uh, the, the, the pressures of life uh, uh, <coughs> differ in those particular groupings. Uh, and, uh, and they're always intense. The poor have to somehow make a living. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes they, and life tells them, well, you can always do this and you'll manage the, the powerful have many different pressures. Um, how do you deal uh, um, with uh, your flock that 
means well, but is not always successful in, 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 in managing to, to perform according to expectations. By always encouraging them to do, to do better, to, uh, to be pastorally uh, uh, cognizant of, of where they are, and trying every day to uplift them uh, through, the, uh, through an inspiring uh, sermon, through uh, the proper pastoral uh, care. Uh, as you say, every, every individual has a particular um, set of problems. We're not all the same, but I think uh, uh, Christ can fill the emptiness in, 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 in the heart and soul of, of, of all people. And as long as we encourage them to, pr to prayer, to, to reading the gospel every day, to, to filling their tank, uh, so mm -hmm. to speak, every day with, um, with the fuel of Christ, and, and uh, I, I think we accomplish our, our task. Would, uh, would uh, uh, any of you, or all, hopefully, uh, perhaps tell us, um, how does the, our church deal with failure? Uh, for these expectations, and, and I mean major failure. I, maybe I could answer And that. I don't need to explain <coughs> major failure, but just imagine yeah. the worst that we can do as human beings, and we come to confession, we come to the priest, we come and say, um, is there different denominations, different faiths deal differently, and, and you don't have to describe them, but how, do, how is, is our church dealing with failure, human frailty? I guess there's a way of answering that question that would say that there's no effort that can be undertaken that is not going to be accompanied by a measure of failure. Now, uh, anybody who, um, who begins to tr uh, tr uh, tries to do something, to accomplish something, uh, will, will constantly be falling short while they're trying to accomplish what they're doing. They will make mistakes, they will keep falling. And so it's a pattern of life. The question is to keep clear the goal. And the goal uh, for the Christian is to grow in the image and the likeness of God to become um, more fully what God created us to be. If that goal is in front of us, then uh, we have um, the expectation that every effort that we undertake cannot succeed, but that if we're moving in the right direction, then, then, uh, uh, um, then that is in part a success. When we actually do fail, then the key uh, motif in the Orthodox Christian tradition is the motif of repentance uh, uh, re uh, and confession uh, and um, the rest, uh, changing of our way of life and the acceptance, the learning to accept the forgiveness that God gives us. There's a passage in the Bible where some disciples said, well, how many times should we forgive? Seven times. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. That wasn't a mathematical answer. That was a, that was a question in saying that, that both we must learn to forgive others when they harm us, and we have to be ready to seek forgiveness from God when we fail and fall short. The question is, are we moving in the right direction? I would just like to add to, to that, which was a very uh, complete statement, that, or rather to, to stress that what is all important is not uh, so much that we, uh, that we fail, but that we, uh, or how often we fail, but that each time we, we try to correct our failures, we are sincere in whatever uh, we do to repent and change our ways, that we are, in other words, constantly involved in that effort to correct ourselves. Uh, that is stressed in our uh, sacrament of penance. And we have uh, periods during the year, we are now in the period of uh, Great Lent, which is a reminder that we have to constantly struggle uh, to overcome the, the failures uh, that we all have as human beings and that there is uh, a, a time set aside for this um, reminder that we need to be vigilant and that we need to be attentive to um, address the failures and the weaknesses that are in us. The church provides us with uh, this um, uh, period in the period. liturgical life of the church where we can do that. Yes. On the, past, on the parish level, yes. it's very interesting to tr apply this idea on a parish level. I, uh, when I speak to seniors of our, who are about ready to leave the school, I tell them that uh, they have a, when they go into a parish, uh, they should think of this as their first task to go into the parish and, and learn where this parish is, where the people are in terms of their Christian growth and what have you, and then to understand their task as helping this parish move from that point forward 
No parish is perfect, none at all. And so if, you, if a, a young priest or a new priest going into an older, uh, an older priest going into a new parish would look at this parish and say, well, where are they? What's the next steps on, in their growth? And um, in this process to try to move this parish, and then I say there's a particularly American kind of question, which is, um, which is uh, what's a successful priest? And that, I don't think anybody else asks questions like that. Only here in America do we ask questions like that. But what is a successful priest? Well, it can't be that he increased the treasury or that even numbers don't necessarily mean that, that the job has been done. Pro uh, right. What is? Well, if you could say after five, six, seven years of ministry in a parish that somehow this parish is closer to God, somehow this parish has grown somehow in its parish, in its prayer life, somehow this parish reflects a little of the kingdom a little more than it did before, then you, you are a successful yeah. priest. And so, in, in, uh, but in that process, um, th that, that there will be stumblings, that there will be failures, that there will, you know, th that sort of thing, and uh, is inevitable, inevitable, it can't be otherwise. But then the question is, how does one pick up, reorient it, and then I tell them, for instance, that your job as a priest is to pull them forward, but then to relax a little bit so that these things can become consolidated, so that these become the normal ways of doing things, and then you, you keep moving forward. This is directed to all of you, but I will, I will start with uh, Dr. Patsavos, and, uh, and we only have about five minutes, so we'll use that perhaps theme to conclude. You are director of the field uh, 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 education, education mm -hmm. program, which means that the, the, the seminarians are out there in the field dealing with, uh, with patients, uh, nursing homes, drugs, all the problems that are out there. Uh, I was watching on, 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 on television recently about a, a, a minister, I don't remember the faith, in the middle of the gangs in LA. And the fact that he had their complete, uh, complete credibility and was functioning in the middle of that, those wars, literally in the middle of, of fire, and yet he was ministering to the needs of those people that perhaps have no hope. And they, and they react to life in this aggression. One important thing, aside from the strength of his person, etc., it was unconditional love. There was one place they could go to, one person they could go to and expect no less than absolute, total, unconditional love, no matter if they had killed, whatever, whatever, the day before, the moment before. You, doctor, and you as teachers of people, priests, that are going out there very soon, uh, is this one of the elements that you suggest to them? And then what are others? Very key, very important elements that put the priest apart. And so a parish or a group can look up and emulate and be inspired, you know, even for, for the little measure, for the small measure that you mentioned. Well, I, I think uh, both Father Harakas and uh, Dr. Patsavos will uh, agree with me that a priest has to be a, a, a man, first of all, of, of, of love, of prayer, and of service. And I think that if, if, if the congregation, if the members of the community see in their priest someone who himself is, is first and foremost a man of prayer, uh, who leads a, a holy life, is a man that, that knows how to love uh, his community uh, through the service that he offers, that he will uh, by his example and by uh, the grace of God, draw people closer to, to God. He has to be a man of, of love, obviously. Um, Thank you. Since you, you raised the, the um, uh, issue of the training that uh, the students receive, I think that um, what we try to do here as uh, educators is to make available to our students the kind of situations that will await them when they're called to uh, serve uh, either as um, ordained clergy or as uh, uh, active lay people. And that's precisely what the field education program is all about, making available those kinds of uh, situations. I think that our students sometimes are very frustrated because they don't feel prepared for what uh, they experience. Uh, obviously not everyone is ready to mm -hmm. undertake that kind of a mission such as the uh, clergyman that you mentioned uh, in the midst of uh, drug lords and, and the rest. But nonetheless, even to, to experience um, uh, peripherally uh, what happens out there in the world and what these uh, young men and women are going to need to uh, prepare themselves for, I think is a, uh, a shot in the arm for them and uh, a rude awakening 
to um, what, being, what being a Christian leader in the world today is all about. I'm very happy that you raised the question of love because in the last analysis, if we were to ask ourselves, well, what is it about Christian lifestyle and what have you that is, that summarizes the whole thing, it would be love. But love oftentimes gets misunderstood. Love is, is there often a difference between unconditional love and love, or should it ever? Well, the, our society uses love in so many different ways that it's almost comes down to not being, not designating very much specifically. Right. Uh, it is so widely used and used in so many different contexts that it has lost its unique Christian uh, kind of character. And I would we say, we have thirty seconds. Love is being concerned about the welfare of others without a personal interest. Love is to care very deeply about the welfare of others. And that's what Christ did and God did for us. For either clergy or lady. For either clergy or lady. Thank and you. love often has to be sacrificial. And that's what's unconditional. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. This has been a very moving, at least for me, program. And you have been watching Holy Cross Live. This is Yanis Simonidis for Illuminations. Thank you for joining us.